Douglas, right here. David um, is a conservation biologist. He spoke here in 2008 at one of our other programs, um, and that one was focusing on the light brown apple moth. Um, and he will be talking about the SCARE programs that are um, at the heart of the native plant restoration movement. I want to emphasize that um, nobody I know and nobody who's been working on these issues is ever suggesting you shouldn't plant what people talk about as native plants. That's not what we're talking about. It's that these native plant restoration projects like this, that's what we're, we're looking at, where people are saying take down a healthy ecosystem and replant with something else that in this case, on Mount Sutro and in the hills here, by the way, would create more fire danger. Dramatically more fire danger. So again, you know, if people want to go all, you know, so-called native, they're going to have to kind of remove, in most cases, almost everything they see around them anyhow. Acclimation occurs, and, we, and new ecosystems are created, and that is a, a natural part of ecology. Um, so David, are you prepared? Well, let's see. Talking about nativity, let's see, I was born in Redwood City. Uh, and being this old, I remember, I mean, like there were cattle grazing in Redwood City when I was a kid. And uh, I remember picking cherries with my parents on El Camino Real in like Sunnyvale. So I've seen the changes around here. And so I'm sad about the orchards going, and now there's nothing but houses, but we've gained so much and all the wonderful people who have moved here. I mean, think about that, all the smartest people in the world coming here. So I don't uh, begrudge that a bit. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, I, uh, let's see, I've been working on this uh, natives versus invasives for, God, 30 years. About God, it's already 10 years ago I wrote my book, Invasion Biology, Critique of a Pseudoscience. And it's, uh, sure, any time. It's kind of interesting to, I've been vilified for this book and denounced by a bunch of academics, but now they're plagiarizing me. So it's very satisfying. And yeah, you know, I'm really not very good at this because I'm sort of a biology detail geek. So I tend to put way too much detail in my talks. I just hope, I hope you enjoy it. And I want to say that was a great presentation on the eucalyptus. I'm going to be kind of embarrassed when I get to my, the, the eucalyptus part of my presentation because that was so much better. And I need bifocals. But other than that, okay. We're ready to go? Okay. Uh, let's see. So that's the title of my talk. If you take home just one word from my talk, remember Monsanto. Anytime you hear the term invasive species, think Monsanto. Okay, this is some of the language that's used to uh, describe invasive species. I mean, look at this, a cancer on the land, a disease, a genetically deviant miscreants, a war on weeds. Uh, locked in combat with unrelenting armies. They always use these war metaphors. There's another one. Fighting them is like a war. And again, the cancer of invasion. Uh, you know, I, I sometimes wonder about these people. How can they use this language? I think perhaps they're, they're dizzy from too much circular reasoning. <laughs> okay. Invasion biology, which is the, uh, what they call the study of invasive species, uh, it stands or falls on this concept of native or alien. So I'll take a few minutes to, uh, uh, to, to sort of dismantle that. Let's see, is this moving? Okay, so anyway, what is native? Okay, if we look at just the most recent 2% uh, of our life history on this planet, uh, we've had like 
the, the tropics have uh, advanced all the way up to Greenland. We had palm trees in Greenland. Uh, the elephants reached the Americas. Uh, camels, anteaters, armadillos, and sloths all evolved here in North America. Uh, 13 different stocks in the elephant family came out of Africa and reached uh, North and South America. And uh, bison, I mean, that symbol of Native America is a recent immigrant. Okay, uh, this is Tree of Heaven, which is being killed in California as an invader. It's uh, most recently from Asia. Uh, Tree of Heaven was he present here in the tertiary, as was ginkgo. Ginkgo is now lim an endangered species limited to a tiny area in China. It was present here in North America. Again, the bison came here just two million years ago. And this is a representation of the evolution of the bovids, which is like bison and cattle. They, they originated here, and the stocks made it all the way to the Americas. OK, the proboscideans, elephants, mastodons, mammoths, these guys were walking around right here where we are, are meeting uh, mere thousands of years ago. Uh, and this is a representation. They, they started in Africa or they, and then radiated. They invaded other continents. Uh, let's see. Yeah, sorry, I'm not very good at this. Okay, and like Im imagine having, like people are worried about the wild boar. Imagine having mammoths and mastodons running around tearing things up. Okay, the quaternary, that's only a t one two thousandth of the history of life. Uh, repeated glaciations have driven species. We've been whiplashed by the cycles of ice ages in the last couple of million years. Uh, the Amazon basin uh, turned into a grassland. A Death Valley was a lake. Uh, marsupials returned to North America. They were here before, but uh, now the... Uh, I guess it's the, the possum has returned. Also, we think, okay, so something is native. This is the, mo the modern distribution of this beetle, Aphodius holderary. It's known in the Himalayas. It's present, it's, fossils of it are abundant in sediments in Britain just 26,000 years ago. So it was formerly there. Okay. Post-glacial, this is like just an instant in time, the last 15,000 years. That, that's just like the day before yesterday. Uh, tundra has moved 2,000 kilometers north. Uh, tundra almost vanished from Eurasia back when the planet was warmer, late xerothermic, 8,000 to 3,000 years ago. Uh, forests change in uh, composition and structure. They change from pine to birch to mixed hardwoods and pine and back to hardwoods. So forests are not these stable things that, that last. And this is a very, another very interesting one, Suga canadensis. I think that's the eastern red cedar. Uh, it, it completely vanished from the pollen uh, record at 4,850 years ago, but then it recovered. And again, the uh, elephants were here just 7,500 years ago. Human beings hunted elephants here. Uh, horses, remember, they evolved here in North America. They radiated or invaded other continents and became extinct here. And now they've returned when the uh, Spanish brought them back. Uh, they, they are genetically identical. The ones that were present here 6,000 years ago are genetically identical to the ones that are here now. Uh, just technical stuff to satisfy the academics. Uh, these species move back and forth. Like when, okay, the bears, that means they, they moved from one hemisphere to the other and then back again five, four or five times. Uh, camels, that's another group. They evolved here in North America. They radiated to other continents. They became extinct here. If they hadn't invaded South America and... Uh, the Eastern Hemisphere, that whole ancient group would be extinct. In fact, deer, they, they are, they're another immigrant from uh, Eurasia. 
Okay, the musk ox, uh, it used to be present in Siberia. It became extinct there in prehistoric times. It's been uh, naturalized from, they, people took specimens from North America, they naturalized them in Siberia. Again, this is a species that is coming home. Uh, lions are native to North America. There were lions uh, present in an ice-free desert in northern Alaska during the Ice Age. Uh, again, horses. The jaguar used, formerly ranged north to the tree line uh, just before it turns into, into tundra. Now, uh, in uh, ecosystems, these top predators can have tremendous effects on the structure of the, assembly of, the assemblage of species. Uh, in fact, a jaguar was sighted near Monterey, I think it was in 1814, I think. So this is very recent. Uh, disjunct distributions, uh, they, these really uh, demolish nativity. We have a, a storax that is native only in California and Turkey, uh, Melica subulata, the onion grass, from Alaska to central California and also in southern Chile. These are natural distributions. And uh, Scirpus validus is native to North America and Australia. Okay, species continue to move. Like, look at Krakatoa. After the uh, volcanic erup eruption, there was just sterile, bare rock. Uh, 1,100 species crossed open water to reach there. Uh, rafting of vegetation mats has carried large animals long distances across the ocean. Uh, long distance transport of other organisms is common. 10% uh, of the, the native New Zealand uh, land birds have arrived in historical times. Uh, yeah, 25 species of birds have uh, immigrated into Greenland since 1930. And uh, here's a bird. This is the cattle egret, which came on its own power from Africa to South America, and it has since spread from Newfoundland to uh, Patagonia. Okay, invasion. They, they, uh, all of the phenomena that are associated with an invasion are identical to natural, uh, natural effects. It's like changes in disturbance regimes or, the, or climate change can completely change the content and uh, structure of ecosystems. And of course, then we have the, okay, they, they talk about invaders suddenly uh, expanding their populations. This is completely natural. They're jackrabbit explo population explosions, lemmings, oak moths, and natural monocultures also occur. Uh, and also species can change basic ecosystem properties. And, uh, oh, the keystone species like the lion and the jaguar, you, you, when those are absent, you'll have a whole cascade of changes over time in the ecosystem. Okay, this is a, uh, and this, notice this dense monoculture invading the meadow. And you can see this is a single species stand. This is the native bracken fern, one of the most widely distributed species on the planet. That's a completely natural, uh, natural phenomenon. Okay, let's see. And yeah, the, the effects of climate change are really important. It's like, how many of you know that in human beings have lived in Phoenix longer than saguaro cacti? Okay, I gotta catch up to my paper here. Okay, uh, also we have to, disabuse ourselves of the notion that uh, our ecosystems, they're, they're not these, they're not co-evolved, tightly knit communities. In fact, the idea of a community is actually discredited in, e in ecology. They're pro more properly called assemblages. And in fact, all of the species that are characteristic in uh, as assemblages today, all are present in completely different groups in the fossil, fossil record. So it's not like you have you know, people still talk about the, like, you know, the oak 
community or something. They're not that tightly knit. And uh, let's see, for example, prairie dogs completely change the uh, composition and structure of plant assemblages. Uh, a sea urchin die-off uh, changed, caused a change from open sea to a closed canopy kelp forest, which in turn cha completely changed the fish fauna. And these are all completely natural, natural things. Now, modern ecology, the stability or uh, the balance of nature, that's discredited. Nature is imbalanced. Uh, in fact, m ecosystems t tend to self-organize towards critical states that are subject to catastrophic occurrences, like the buildup of uh, fuel in a forest leading to a catastrophic fire. And it's these catastrophic changes that actually help maintain landscape uh, biological diversity. Could you repeat that? Yes, please repeat that. Okay. Uh, a lot of ecosystems are finding they tend to self-organize towards critical states, which are then subject to catastrophic events. Like think of the like the buildup of fuel in in a forest or in chaparral, that is then subject to a catastrophic fire, which completely changes the uh, the the assemblage of plants and animals on that site. But it, it's these catastrophic occurrences that are essential for maintaining biological diversity. Okay, so. What we need to do is, if we look at the, the most popular invaders, okay, purple loosestrife, it's, that's, that's big in the east. You don't hear as much about it out here. It's literally the poster weed of uh, invasion biology. Okay, if you actually, okay, it's said to be really aggressive, form dense monotypic stands that displace native vegetation. And uh, one guy said it destroys waterfowl habitat quote, reducing its wildlife value to roughly that of a parking lot. Uh, the National Invasive Species C Council places it on their top 10 invaders. Uh, Bright calls the plant a monster. Okay, look at the science. A study of 258 plots found higher bird densities in loosestrife stands than in other vegetation types, including 10 uh, breeding species. Treberg and husband studied 41 plots and found no significant difference in vascular plant species richness. That's the number of different plant species present on the site, uh, regardless of the percentage of loose strife cover. Hager and McCoy traced the history of purple loose strife and found little scientific evidence that it has deleterious effects and state, quote, there is currently no scientific justification for the control of loose strife. Yet, it is the subject of massive extermination programs throughout the East. Yeah. Okay, salt cedar. Uh, this is in the, usually in the arid West. Uh, it's called a disastrous ecological menace, one of the nation's worst weeds. They claim it changes the river hydrology, increases flooding, sedimentation, and salinization, crowds out cottonwood and willow, and drives native species to the edge. Uh, yet studies have demonstrated that native seedlings are com competitively superior to salt cedar, and the salt cedar establishes in soils that are already too saline for native species to uh, establish. Uh, Stromberg found that salt cedar actually enhances floristic diversity. Herbaceous species richness and cover is significantly greater in salt cedar than cottonwood, and stem density of native woody successional species are equivalent. Burton Anderson, a buddy of mine down in the Colorado, has found that avian species, I shouldn't use these words, bird species richness and density in salt cedar is equivalent to uh, native vegetation, and biomass and diversity of insects in salt cedar stands is comparable to those in cottonwood and willow. And in fact, 90% of the endangered uh, willow flycatcher nest in salt cedar. Uh, 30 years ago, Everett 
uh, pointed out that salt cedar is a symptom of the abuse of riparian areas. And he says there is no evidence that it actively displaced native species, nor that it played an active role in changing the hydro hydraulic and morphological properties of the ri river. Now, these aren't biased uh, people. I mean, Burton Anderson, he does restorations, and he told me, hey, you know, I, I love salt cedar, but there's times when I've s s told a bulldozer driver, see that pretty green? Kill it. But, you know, that's just a site-specific thing when he's hired to do that. Okay, eucalyptus, what you all love. Uh, you're, and you guys are way ahead of me on this one. Okay, again, we've got these crazy claims. They're silent beauty, masks a quiet destructiveness. The most monstrous organisms on earth. Uh, they're, they're, their leaves and bark are so toxic, they kill all plants around them to ensure there will be no competition. Okay, let's take a look. This is a uh, California toyon growing right at the base of that eucalyptus. Uh, these are uh, native baccarus clustered at the base of this one. And this is a transect leap from about 30 feet out from the trunk of that eucalyptus leading up to the tree. Here we have uh, dense uh, introduced grasses and a couple of native forbs. And as we approach the tree, the native plants increase in cover. And see, those are our native bunch grasses, and you can see the eucalyptus uh, leaf litter and leading up to the trunk where it's 100% native species. And now you compare that to the complete suppression of understory by this invader. Any guesses? Redwood. California redwood, which invaded California from the north during the tertiary. Okay, uh, the major okay, this is a, a monarch overwintering cluster in a eucalyptus. The uh, majority of these overwintering con congregations are in eucalyptus in California. It's pre preferred by monarchs. And this, of course, is what the nativists do to our groves. This was on San Bruno Mountain. Okay, fire. You all know about how they're uh, being blamed for the East Bay fire. When was that? Uh, 91, okay. I love this picture. Before and after, you can notice the, the, the glow is the fire approaching the camera from behind this row of eucalyptus trees. After, the house is completely de destroyed, the car is a shell, the eucalyptus trees still have their leaves. Well, okay, the fire was behind these trees. It came towards the camera. It completely destroyed this house, but it, the eucalyptus trees are untouched. They didn't burn. It, it came through the trees. So, uh, I mean, I remember listening on the radio when the, when the fire was happening and everybody was screaming about eucalyptus and it, it was just nonsense. People love to hate. They love to blame things on people. Oh, yeah, we'll get to that. Uh, okay, yellow star thistle. It's another one that's supposed to be a, a terrible invader. Oh, let's see. Oh, yeah, I even forgot to mention, yeah, 47 species of native birds use eucalyptus. Uh, the understory contains 36 species. Three centimeters of eucalyptus mulch did not inhibit the germination of native species. Uh, they, they, protect, they protect the lion ta endangered lion tamarind in Brazil. And uh, let's see. Oh, and actually, they claim it sucks water out of the soil. Uh, studies have found that it can take surface water, draw it into the eucalyptus, and uh, push it back out into the soil deeper down uh, from the eucalyptus roots. So it's, it's actually in, increasing the, the soil's water supply. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, almost everything you hear about them is just is completely bogus. Okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, because my, you know. Right. Yeah, I told you I'm not very good at this. Uh, eucalyptus 
uh, the surface roots can absorb surface water, water in the surface layers of the soil. They suck it into the tree. The tree transports it down into the subsoil and it secretes it through its, uh, its deeper roots. So it's taking, it's like sequestering water. If the surface water would be subject to evaporation, but the eucalyptus is actually increasing the water in the subsoil because it transports water and uh, puts it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, if you include the fog drip, the, it's taking uh, moisture out of the air, depositing it on the ground, sucking it up through the surface roots. Put and secreting it down uh, deeper in the soil where it'll be available later in the season after the rains have ended. Uh, no, I just got ahead of myself here, sorry. Uh, the trouble is I really need bifocals so I can see that and my paper. Okay, star thistle. It, you know, that's probably a good idea, but I'd look ridiculous for the film. Uh, <laughs> I look ridiculous enough already. Uh, okay, star thistle is supposed to be this terrible invader uh, of no use to native wildlife. Okay, this is a native ant species using the flower. The, uh, this is another native ant, I don't know, a Campanotus, I've forgotten. A, a native skipper. Butterfly, native uh, bumblebee, another, uh, this is another uh, native wild bee, another species of wild bee, if you can see it there on the flower. Now all the insects that the, that the star thistle is attracting, uh, the predators come, there's an orb weaver and another spider. So you see you have a, a, a whole new food web knitting itself together. There's another spider. These are fascinating, fascinating. I encourage everyone to find a really dense stand of star thistle, go out there when it's in full bloom, you will see so much. This one I love because see the yellow hunting spider that's hiding there? ready to pounce on somebody that, somebody that visits the, the flower. Now you see, if we didn't know that uh, these organisms are from completely different continents, we would say that this was like coevolution co because the yellow color of the, the spider is conceal, helping to conceal it. Okay, this is a, a midden left by one of our native mice, a Paromiscus species. The mice eat the seeds as do the birds, and the birds also use the fluff for their nests. Uh, this is a midden left by uh, one of our rabbits eating the plant. Okay, I like this one. I took this picture in 1999. This is dense star thistle. Notice the barbed wire fence. Now, barbed wire can't stop, can't stop thistle seeds, but there's this very sharp ecotone. That indicates that the presence of the thistle is related to past land use on either side of the barbed wire. Barbed wire ecotones are really fascinating. So 10 years later, see the native sh shrubs have taken over and expanded. The star thistle has, has retreated to this small patch entirely without any management. Okay, poison hemlock. Okay, I, I've been observing this stand for about uh, 36 years. Okay, there's, another whole, there's a beautiful food web happening here. Uh, this is, I believe, is an Olograpta fly. There are, uh, there's a spider web, there are aphids, plenty, of, plenty more aphids. Here is a, a native surfid fly, a native beetle. Okay, the, the, okay, this in, uh, insect fauna uh, draws birds which feed on it. There's one there, there's one there. It's really hard to take these pictures. Let's see, is this slowing down? Oh, it did change. 
okay, uh, something has eaten the leaf. This is a, a leaf that's totally defoliated. Uh, these are the cutoff stems that were uh, cut off by our local native wood rat, uh, Neotoma fusipes. Poison hemlock. Uh, no, nor the uh, the birds. The birds eat the seeds later in the season. The seeds are the most poisonous part of the plant, and they're totally unharmed by it. Uh, this is a tortricid leaf roller, and there's a lady ladybug child, and there's plenty of these. This is just the tip of a leaf. Okay, late, various species of ladybugs and ladybug children here. Uh, let's see, this, these are two species of beetle that come to feed on the pollen. There's also a couple of native ant species that feed on the pollen. Let's see, oh, and again, the predators come. This is a, a spider. Okay, so anyway, when I, I, then I noticed, wait a minute, what's this? This is a primate. So even a primate has been drawn to this stand. <laughs> okay, hydrilla called Florida's worst weed. Okay, it supports the highest, I should get rid of that, highest bird species diversity in Florida, the highest fish density and biomass, six times the density and five times the biomass as the native Potomogeton. It's like in, invasive species, it's, it's not that they're always harmful. And the fish diversity was equal. This is a highly beneficial plant. And it's constantly being attacked and uh, sprayed all over Florida. Uh, same with killer al the, the so-called killer algae in the, uh, in the Mediterranean. They call it aquatic astroturf. Uh, actually, if you do the science, studies show it has no effect on the composition or richness of the fish fauna. It removes pollution from the water and species richness and diversity of, let's see, epiphytic fauna. That's little guys that live on it uh, is, great, is greater than native seagrass beds. It, it, the killer algae is also associated with fertilizer runoff and sewage outfalls, which brings us to this. Are, is invasion a cause or a symptom? Okay, anthropogenic disturbance. That's us and the things we do. We do all this kind of stuff. God, I've got to fix that font. Fire frequency. Uh, yeah, you know, dams, diversions, water table changes. Uh, in fact, salt cedar is associated with the presence of dams because the dams stop the natural flood cycle, which would carry away the salinity in the river, uh, riverine soils, and uh, would prevent the uh, salt cedar from uh, growing. Atmospheric deposition of nitrogen from pollution. Most people don't realize it, but air pollution uh, deposits a great deal of nitrogen into ecosystems. For example, this is looking down on the Jasper Ridge Preserve of Stanford University. Look at that smog. Uh, Stanford scientists cannot make valid generalizations to ecosystems from anything they do on this preserve. Oh, of, of course. It's like, yeah, pesticides, yeah, they just love to use them. Okay, oh, okay, more, more uh, cause, cause or symptom. Uh, the, in, the sea lamprey, when it entered the Great Lakes, they claimed that it uh, caused the collapse of the fishery. Uh, actually, the lamprey was p present for over 100 years before the fishery collapsed, and uh, the decline in native species was actually due to PCB pollution, which interfered with the fish reproduction, as well as massive prolonged overfishing. So between synthetic fertilizer air, and air pollution, we've doubled the amount of nitrogen that is going into the Earth's ecosystems. And in Southern California, Los Angeles smog is fertilizing the desert downwind with 36 pounds of nitrogen per acre. That's like what farmers put on their fields. So of course you're going to have changes in the vegetation. Okay, uh, anthrop more anthropogenic disturbance. We've covered some of this. Uh, cryptic disturbance is often overlooked. It's, that's like the nitrogen being deposited from smog. You can go out into a pristine area of the desert. There's no roads. There's no people. There's no 
the cattle, but we have cryptic disturbance. Also, displacement of traditional peoples. Okay, this is, this is key uh, because the traditional people's life ways are very important to maintaining biodiversity. Uh, for example, invasion, invasionists claim that recent Australian mammal extinctions are due to the introduced fox, cats, livestock, and rabbits. Yet many of the extinctions occurred in areas that were never reached by introduced species. But these extinctions only happened after the genocidal displacement of the aboriginal peoples and the loss of the, their, their land management practices. Uh, in the south, our southwest, bird diversity dropped after Indian farmers were forced from the land to create protected parks. In, here in California, there were tremendous changes due to the loss of the uh, Indian land management. They, they burned, they dug, they did all sorts of things. In the Amazon, Indian peoples increase uh, rainforest species diversity. And in Switzerland, traditional grazing practices increase alpine meadow biodiversity. And of course, in Africa, the traditional peoples have maintained the last remaining uh, megafauna on the planet. I take this as to, so that we, should, we need to realize we can be good citizens of the planet. You know, we're, we're so used to seeing ourselves only as vandals and destroyers, but we can be good citizens. Uh -huh.